Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. What day is it? I don't even know. It's, it's Monday. <laughs> it's Monday. It's December 3rd. We're back. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. Uh, I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Oh, hi, everybody. Hey, what's going on? We got some stuff to talk about today. Uh, brain implant uh, lets paralyzed people turn thoughts into text. We got the uh, first global drone standards, which is awesome. Yes. And then uh, uh, this plane flying 29 miles past Australian destination after the pilot falls asleep. How could that happen? What were the circumstances surrounding this? What could it possibly mean? I don't know. We'll figure it all out. But Sometimes first, you get tired. Uh, we got some stuff. Hey, welcome, new listeners. We usually pick up a lot of you after uh, some coverage. So, uh, welcome. We just did a special HFES Australia 2018 coverage with a uh, friend of the show, Mateo. You've seen him in our Slack uh, all over the place, really. He's, he's posting left and right. He, he, he went down under uh, to go. Does he live down under? He, he lives down under, I mean, but he went down under into the depths of HFES Australia to bring us a report. Uh, so go check out that bonus episode. He's talked about some really interesting things. Uh, my my favorite thing from that talk was the uh, VR periscopes. Yeah, I really love talking about the making sure that when you're engineering basically a brand new hospital, the importance of having human factors people involved. That was amazing. So those are plugs for the show. Go watch it. Go listen to it. Uh, I mentioned watch it. We're on YouTube. We need a couple more of you to get to that magical 100 subscribers mark. We're uh, almost there. We, we know how many of you listen to the show. Uh, we just need you to go and hit that button. We would so um, enjoy it if you could. We really would. Uh, so, hey, we're giving away an HFES annual membership. Did you know that, Blake? Uh, I didn't know that, Nick. When <laughs> did we start doing that? Hey, we started this a couple weeks ago. Um, so, uh, some benefits from getting an HFES membership is you get discounted rates to the annual meeting. You get a journal that's delivered to you. Um, you Which we've talked about doing some bits from on the show. Yeah, absolutely. Lots of fun. Um, we, you also get access to uh, networking opportunities, workshops, webinars, a bunch of different things, and HFES is fronting the bill. They're giving it to you for free. All you have to do is go enter our contest. We put a link in the description. Uh, we tweeted it out. Uh, there's, there's a couple other places you can find it. But please go enter that. We are closing the uh, we're closing the contest in what is it two weeks? I guess we're closing it on the sixteenth. So act now, do not delay. Uh, this is a great deal. Even if you're um, even if you're an existing member, they'll they'll comp the next year. If you're not a member, this is a great opportunity to get in. Um, so just just a good deal all around. And just uh, so you know, like HFES is working really hard to revamp the website and kind of target content that you actually want to read, similar to like how other organizations do it. So I mean, this is a good time to really hop in and try and get an HFES comp membership because it's this is probably a lot of times they're going to be testing a lot of new cool features. So I can encourage people please jump in and try and get that free membership. Yeah, please do. Um. Are you interested in being the voice of the future of HFES? I don't know, Nick. Are you? Oh yeah, I am interested in because in he is the future. I, I'm chairing the committee. Uh, the, the, the goal of this committee is to analyze HFES annual meeting and to make recommendations on how to improve it, to figure out what we can do and and sort of how we can improve the conference going forward. So if you guys have any bright ideas, send them my way. Um, I'm happy to. That's why they they chose me is because I. I we, You're so bright. The future we, is no, so bright. No, we're connected, Blake. We're connected to an audience of human factors, people, students, everything. If you're listening to the show, you count. Uh, your voice matters. Let me hear it, and we'll we'll bring it forward to the, the powers that be, and, and we'll try to get those ideas implemented. Where's a good place for them to get you, Nick? Should it be in the Slack? Slack, uh, Twitter, uh, basically anywhere. LinkedIn. Yeah. Raven, pigeon, all that kind of stuff. Raven, pigeon, yeah. Uh, I, I'm especially fond of the uh, gerbil delivery service. Man, you're, you're uh, the best. Yeah, it's all over. Um, hey, so we just did our last event of the year, which is HFES Australia. Um, so we already plugged that, but please go listen to it. It's a great conversation that we had with Mateo. But it's never too soon to start looking forward to other events. We got Healthcare Symposium just on the horizon. Uh, IEEE and Kai are also next year. Um, so... Blake, the holidays are coming up here Again. in the States. And I know we just had Thanksgiving uh, and now there's going to be Christmas and the new year. 
Uh, if you celebrate, we're just doing a holiday break here at the show. But that doesn't mean that the fun has to end. So Blake and I are going to... Oh, stop it. You stop. did not. The fun doesn't have to end the here, The fun folks. doesn't have to end here. <laughs> uh, we will be on Slack and everything through the holidays. So if you are if you want to say hi, please say hi. We are going to record a couple special bonus episodes. I guess they're not bonus episodes. They're just episodes that we pre-record. Yeah. Um, but we're going to be taking a look at our 2018 predictions. Uh, and seeing which ones came true, which where we hit the mark, where we missed. Oh, man. Uh, we're going to be going over every single news story that we covered this year uh, on the show. So much news. But it, it, that's a great opportunity for us to go back and kind of explore some of these things that happened. And, and you know, a lot of times you'll get these follow ups like stories will happen. And then there's these follow ups that we don't necessarily talk about on the show. So it's a great time to kind of follow up and be like, oh, yeah, I remember that. That was great. Let's. uh. Let's dive deep into that a little bit. It would be kind of cool to go back and see what the trends were for the year, too. Because, I mean, we talked about so much related to healthcare all year and then the implementation of, you know, smart tracking your fitness and how that has, like, an implication on your health and all that kind of good stuff. So it's going to be a lot of fun to like, go back through all that yeah. for 2018. It's a really fun retrospective. So we hope that you'll join us. At the end of it, we'll top it all off with our 2019 predictions, and that will uh, hit right on December 31st. A nice little New Year's Eve treat for you all. Um, or I guess if you're in Australia, it'll hit on the first. So it'll be perfect timing either way, I think. There you go. Start your new year right. <laughs> All right. So before we jump into the news, Blake, I got to know what's going on in your world because this sounds awfully familiar to me. This does sound awfully familiar. So I was telling Nick before the show started as I asked him what his banter for the show was. I was like, I need to just write these down because I swear after we do the show and it's not Monday night anymore, a flood of things happens during the week and I'm like, I got to talk about that as my banter. I should talk about that as my banter. That would make great banter points. And I never write them down and then I get here huh. and I don't have anything. Huh. It's almost as if someone on a couple shows ago told you to write it down. Yeah, I think it was Jeff Olson, our uh, wonderful uh, video video editor, artist. probably told you to write it down. Yeah. But uh, you know what? I can almost go back to the episode exactly and say write it down. Like which write it down. Uh, to make that into the next John Cena. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> write it down. Uh, I bet you it was on. Um, I bet it was on this one. I bet you it was this. Uh, how many bets if he's right? Nope. nope. I'm, I'm wrong. Anyway. Get out of here, Spider-Man. Uh, all right. Yeah, that was a Spider-Man banter. But so, Nick, you Spider had banter. some interesting stuff going on earlier today. Yeah, so. While I was writing the show notes. Uh, unbeknownst to me, you were writing the show notes, and I was hanging out here in the studio because uh, we were we were uh, queuing up to talk to Mateo about HFES Australia. Yeah, we learned how to tell time. We did. And um, so as, as I was waiting for him, uh, it, you walked in. And as I was doing that, I was I was kind of um, customizing my Plex server. Now, what's a Plex server? Because we've talked <laughs> about this on the show before, but I yeah. kind of forgot what it was. So to refresh everybody, a Plex server is basically a media server, which you can uh, store all of your media on one device and then stream it to wherever you're at, your phone, your laptop, even most video game consoles have them now. So you can basically log into this app and it's a good way for you to basically go through your media. If you have a favorite show, you can hit go and random to your any episode. Um, they're great for sharing with others. So if I shared my server with you, you'd be able to ping my uh, basically my folder that I have. But it's it's presented to you in a way that's easily human digestible. It's 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 very usable. It uh, looks really good. Like the yeah. interface and everything seemed like it was pretty pretty well put together it's pretty slick so yeah. what i've been doing and this has kind of been a pipe dream of mine is to uh, it's no secret on the show i watch uh fan edited movies gasp i uh, yeah so i watch i watch altered content is uh the best way i can describe it so this is fan edited movies this is uh comic books that have been voiceovered by you know just any joe schmo but done pretty well uh comic books that have been mixed with sound effects and everyone can kind of guess what franchise i'm talking about here uh but there's a specific franchise that i do this with and so kind of my dream here is to kind of collect all this content into one space so that way i can just enjoy any bit of it um because a, a, a challenge with something like comic books is you can't just say random and you get a random issue or whatever but if they I do might ruin the story or something strange like that. Yeah. So I've talked about this on the show before is kind of these people that'll go through and, and basically map out the uh, the 
comic books to music and sound effects and all that stuff, right? And so basically what happened... <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god! Oh, that it's a show now, folks. It's, <laughs> we it's like a show now, in. folks. Oh god! <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even going to describe what happened. If you want to watch, go on YouTube, <laughs> Jeff. There you go. Maybe you can edit this out. I don't know. <laughs> we'll, go we'll, on YouTube and just, check it out, guys. Just do your thing. Uh, so anyway, yeah. So I like to do so with the comments, the comics. Those are all in there, and what I can do now is I can randomize. <laughs> also in here, let me. <laughs> Let me explain what's going on and why all this chaos is ha- <laughs> happening. This show is off the rails. We're 10 minutes in. And why is that? I thought that was only the Infinite episodes. What's going on? Jeez, uh, yeah. What, what's what's going on, Blake? So uh, what's so funny about the word balls? <laughs> what's so funny about the shape of a ball? <laughs> what is going on? So <laughs> you can watch on the YouTube. I... And I was doing this during Mateo's presentation, so I'm sorry, Mateo. The worst thing this. ever to do when you're talking to anybody. But I'm, I'm fidgeting with this thing. It's it's basically like a uh, – wow, I'm just – it's everywhere today. I There's uh, this thing, and it's basically a little, like, posable uh, arm in which you can – there's a, there's a ball at the end of it. It's, a, it's, a, it's supposed to be holding the soundboard, a.k.a. Nick's phone. <laughs> it's supposed to be holding the soundboard, and what happens is – I took it off so that way the soundboard can sit up. Anyway, I've been sitting with it, and Blake has the video portion up on the sh- of the show up on his end, and I'll just like peek really it just out, lifting the curtain here. I, how we do this? Oh uh, yeah, I'm peeking it out, and like you can see it, and Blake just started cracking up. And so, <laughs> as I was alluding to it, or as I was doing it, describing my Plex server, Blake lost it, and then I lost it. <laughs> so, what is so funny about the word ball, and what is so funny about balls? That's what I got to know. We're asking the real questions here on Human Factors Cast. Ten minutes in, six fifteen on a Monday night. These, we are all where the real the news happens already. Yeah, we're gonna backlog this into infinite. Yeah, you know what? I think you mentioned it, so let's go ahead and get into it. That's Human Factors <laughs> News. This is the part of the show where we're all about Human Factors News, where we talk about yes. everything related to the field of Human Factors. This will be anything from medical, transportation, psychology. we got some aviation in there this week, too. That's exciting. All right, Blake, what do we got up first this week? All right, so first up this week, we got a brain implant that lets paralyzed people turn their thoughts into text. So three people paralyzed from the neck down have been able to use unmodified computer tablets to text friends, browse the internet, and even stream music thanks to an electrode array system called BrainGate 2. Using only their intentions, the participants were able to perform a range of common digital tasks, including web browsing and sending email. BrainGate 2 allows users to navigate completely unmodified off-the-shelf devices with no special features or modifications. Nonetheless, the findings demonstrate how communication, mobility, and independence can be partially restored to those otherwise limited control over their environment and without the need for expensive or specialist equipment. So that's a major development that will have a hugely positive impact in the lives of people around the world. So Nick, this is really intense in that like we, we often talk about a lot of these technologies that allow these kind of things because this is not the first time you and I have brought up the fact of you you know being able to translate your thoughts into text and it being able to help somebody who may either like be in a you know kind of a locked in syndrome state but right. this is incredible in fa- in the fact that it's allowing R- somebody to interact with you know off the shelf con or off the shelf electronics and be able to do the same thing. Yeah, that's the thing that's most interesting to me is that this this can kind of integrate with anything that's out there. Uh and I'd be curious to use this for myself to see kind of what the intuitiveness of it is uh to see whether or not, you know, we can actually um like if if any like how much training does it require? Could could people like you and I use this type of thing or would it require several hours of training to where you like move the mouse to the corners of the screen and then click or something, you know, like what, what does the training look like on this? Yeah. And it's, it's not quite clear to me right now. I mean, it looks like from the image that they have, they, these kind of electrode sets are going to the top of your cranium or the top of your head. And then it, I'm, I'm guessing from the image itself, it looks like it has a mouse that's actually on the screen on one of the screenshots. So I'm not sure if they're moving that the actual cursor itself using like kind of impulses from their eyes or if it's some combination of you know thought turning thoughts into text, which I, I have uh, I have a feeling it's probably the former of them being able to make make eye movements and the electrodes are able to pick up kind of where that is in a direction in space. But 
it's it's an amazing technology, especially since it, it looks now we're not be being able to see the entire full picture here, but it looks like even the electrode set that goes on the top of your head is not that kind of intensive. It doesn't look like a cap. It looks more like kind of an Alexa on the top of your head, if you will. Yeah, I, I yeah, that's the best I can describe it as well. Um, is this Alexa on top of your head? So looking at some of these videos are really interesting. You can kind of see how, at least in this one, the web browsing one, she's actually like using the mouse to type on the keyboard uh, Orchid, right? And then and then she clicks on the search result and it opens up Google. And although it's, it's much slower than perhaps someone with, uh, that would be able to type out, you know, in, in its entirety, um, it, it's still really cool to see somebody who potentially uh, is quadriplegic and can't use their arms or legs to navigate anything. Yeah, so I couldn't tell. Sorry, I got really absorbed watching the video <laughs> um, because I couldn't tell if a lot of it was happening because of eye blinks. Like that was allowing somebody to actually make a decision about clicking on something, if if you will. But it was it was. I'm not gonna lie. It looked like it was difficult. I and just searched through the article. I didn't see anything about blinking. So maybe I don't know. We, we can. Sure. Yeah. But nonetheless, I mean, it doesn't. It looks pretty difficult to do. I mean, moving your eyes around, trying to get that very precise place to click, but still. It's allowing a lot of, you know, interaction that people ne normally wouldn't have, whether it's surfing the web or being able to, you know, basically talk to you, talk to people that you love through, you know, being able just to type it out. Yeah. And, you know, I'm watching this one um, where she's searching right now through the YouTube videos, I think. And I'm like reminded of the importance of autofill uh, for, oh, for yeah. ins instances like this, where perhaps slow uh, typing is slower than natural uh, the, the, not natural, uh, slower than the average, perhaps, um, where auto search or auto complete can help locate uh, things like when they typed in A, the first thing was Ariana Grande, uh, and then they were looking for ALS, but they, they, they're going through and actually watching this video. It's pretty remarkable that they're able to do this with the, only their mind. Well, I would, uh, I would assume, too, and this is a big assumption, but like with the... Like, I, I don't know if you've seen this recently, Nick, but in Gmail, it's autocomplete has gotten it's pretty good. It's a little it freaks me out a little bit. A little I bit. I think it is monitoring my own speech patterns. Sometimes. It does. Um, but so, by integrating some technology like that, that's already got a lot of like base to pull from. I mean, I can imagine making this a lot quicker for people. Um, and it, it would be interesting to see over time how much better people get at this. Because right now you can kind of tell that it, it looks like it's very much eye-based movement, but they're still trying to also move move their heads back and forth a little bit. And I wonder if over time that control becomes a lot more fine with your eyes once you get used to it. I don't think it's eye control. I think it's, is it is it eye monitoring software? Or is it just, I thought it was just brainwaves. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure because it looks like to me that a lot of that stuff is driven by where you're looking precisely on the screen. And I mean, it might blinking. be, it might be a mix, but I, I have a feeling that because they're trying to, like the other woman, she was not moving at all when she was doing hers. And I feel like it's, it's a matter of just um, that natural movement where you want something to go in a direction and you think it. And so your head kind of naturally goes in that sure, direction. Sure, yeah. So like, like, look at this woman. She's not really um, moving all that much. Okay, no, she is looking. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so right, I think maybe, it's a combination maybe I'm full between of the two. <clears throat> maybe, maybe, maybe we should read the articles. <laughs> yeah, Nick, maybe we should read the article next time. Okay, look, I, I've pulled back the curtain on this before. I'm going to pull it back again. We read these. It's just there's so much time. Like, this was right before the last show that I posted this. Yeah. So it's been a week. It's been a week removed. Um but like that's a that is amazing. Nick just pulled up a video that is basically allowing somebody to play piano with this kind of technology. Yeah, and you can see all these. We have a YouTube channel. Go ahead and subscribe to us because we need the one hundred. But but seriously, go check these out because some of these videos are really really neat to watch. People do these things with their mind, and this, I mean, even with just an apparatus on top, these two people are communicating with each other through WhatsApp, um, and that is really remarkable to think when. You know, perhaps they can't do communication because they can't move any part of their body. This has to be some sort of liberating feeling to get part of their uh, digital identity back, at least if they had it before or, you know, to explore this new world where basically they can move around in 
especially if they can operate with off-the-shelf products. Well, now you've got you're kind of dealing with people that might be able to interact in a way that they never could before. And now this is like if this if these are people with ALS, like it suggests, this is now allowing them to garner friendships in their own kind of like small tight knit community within a hospital. So that's even more incredible, right? You're almost gaining friendships through technology. Yeah. I mean, that's that's really cool. I, I, I really love this story. I think it's it's really great. Thanks so much for picking that one, Dick. That was a good one. You're welcome, Blake, for picking that one. That was really good. Uh, okay, why don't we move into the next one? Let's this do it. This one's cool, too. Yeah, this is pretty nuts. So the first global drone standards have finally been revealed. So as drones grow, drone use grows, rules and regulations remain in flux and, and vary among various jurisdictions. And to enable... And to establish best practices, the International Organization for Standards has released the first draft set of global standards for drone use. The draft does suggest no-fly zones around airports and other restricted areas, along with geofencing measures to keep the drones away from sensitive locations. The standards also call for drone operators to respect their others' privacy and a human intervention failsafe for all flights. The ISO additionally suggested that training, for flight logging, and maintenance requirements should be in place, along with data protection rules. While the standards aren't formal rules and similar measures are already in use in certain (laughs) locales, the ISO hopes they'll they'll become the best practices for drone manufacturers and operators across the planet. So, Nick, there's a whole lot to kind of dissect in that one paragraph. I mean, we're going from everything from having no-fly zones and restricted areas to data protection rules. Yeah, I think this is absolutely needed, right? I mean, we've talked about sort of the expansion of the role of drones in our everyday lives and the fact that there's been no standards up until this point for these small unmanned vehicles, I think, uh, or unmanned, are they vehicles? Uh, They're carrying stuff. So yes, technically. Uh, Yes. So anyway, they are small unmanned vehicles. And and the fact that there's been no regulation, no standardization for any of these, um, as of yet is really surprising to me. Uh, I mean, to be fair, the industry kind of, boomed and yeah i got got, like like, huge out of nowhere almost yeah so i mean we're a little bit behind the curve here because drones have already been out on the market for a while and we're used to the standards but uh or or we're used to the social standards i guess but but this is putting a lot of those like data protection rights and no fly zones into law right a lot of airports have already instituted these no fly zones uh and so now this is just standardizing it so that way every airport should you know, as a standard, um, have it X amount of distance away from the tarmac. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. No, I words mean, are hard. I, that, that, it's kind of interesting because like, I'm going to show my age, I guess, but like five years ago when you said drone to me, I thought something like an Icona, like a really big aircraft that was being called a drone. And it truly is one in that sense. But that was what I was expecting when you were talking about like regulations and policy that you're dealing with something that the FAA would have like their hands in. But then all of a sudden we got a lot of traction with these kind of handheld drones that people could have on their own. There was so much talk of Amazon using them in their factories and that we were having, we would be having packages delivered to us that way. So it's, I think it's only natural that this stuff's coming up, but it, it is in some ways surprising that it's kind of taking such a, I don't know, in a lot of ways it feels like a convoluted route uh, just because I feel like there is a lot of kind of safety implications, especially when we're talking about like if you don't maintain your drone very well and it was it happened to go down and you know hurt somebody by accident and that kind of stuff. Um, and then at the same time, like how do you really enforce a lot of this, a lot of these things in terms of like the no fly zone and the restricted zones? That makes sense. I can see how regulators can get in there and how port authorities or whatever can get can have ways to deal with that. But in terms of like privacy, like somebody flying a drone over you know, the fence that's in your backyard. How do you kind of police those kind of things or make it so that that is actually a big rule? Um, And then, you know, capturing and transmitting a data is a whole nother animal with these. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of uh, interesting questions that I have that I would probably get answered if I could read this draft. Uh, (laughs) But I mean, so it's in, it's basically been approved, right? So um, can I just comment on the ISO standards, uh, website this is this is cool have you seen this blake yeah it is so cool the way they the the way they illustrate life cycle is just really neat so they kind of go through like um 
the five year life cycle where they go through like the preliminary stages, the proposal, the preparatory committee, inquiry, approval, publication, review, and withdrawal. Um, and in each step, you can kind of see where it's at now. And in each step, it kind of breaks down like what things have happened. So this is, this is a really cool workflow tool to kind of see where these standards are in the process in case anyone comes back and says, hey, what about this thing, right? And it also shows you what kind of revisions are there. Um, so you're able to really get a hold of the document as it is now. I'm looking for it. Yeah. Maybe I'm just not knowing how to use this thing. There's... Uh, the standards for aircraft and space vehicles in general, right, which is widely accept er, accessible, um, but the specific drone ones, yes, bes- the specific unmanned aircraft systems, uh, one that I'm looking for here, I can't find. So, Baba, well, that's no big deal. I mean, yeah. it's it's good that they're writing it now and trying to get it standardized because I know a lot of people too, in some ways, were kind of afraid to even use their drone anymore because, like, you know. The state doesn't allow them, and then you don't really know where the no-fly zones are because it's not right. super well marked. So hopefully, this kind of helps clear a lot of that up, and people then people are able to use them for like their if they enjoy them, like for video or photography. And then if businesses businesses or law enforcement are using them, then it like kind of drives even more the need for the standards. Yeah, no kidding. You just, you brought up a really great point with law enforcement and and you know government use, and I think maybe that's why we haven't seen very many urban. Uh, examples of drones in action is because these standards aren't established, right? Where, like, can you imagine pat- patrolling drones, like, surveilling for crime from above? So, just, like, patrolling drones. Like, you know, just floating above the city s- streets, and if they spot something, then they report it back, and then they send out a cop car. That's nuts. Yeah, I know, and I think that that's not too, that can't be too far away. No. Because, I mean, it. I, I don't know. I mean, and that's it. another interesting question is, like, do, does this, maybe this gets into, like, AI later on, but initially, does that create a bunch of jobs, like, different kind of operators or air traffic operators that you need for different, for, like, law enforcement or for government agencies or any of that kind of stuff? Yeah, maybe, and definitely need some sort of supervisory control over that system and, and, and to look at, you know, the data that's coming back, right? Looking at, oh, this is a reported whatever you need someone behind the scenes to go, oh, yep, nope, that's definitely like a dispatch operator that says, yep, that's definitely a crime. Let's go send somebody out. And then to have the drone, like, track that person, yeah, that's that's a lot. Yeah, so that's a lot of, like, taxing information, too, to have to deal with and process. So it sounds like a a good kind of split between the human and the machine. Yeah, that does sound really cool. Um, Okay, Blake, do you have any other thoughts on this guy here? No, I'm just glad that we're seeing these standards kind of pop up to make it a little bit easier. And maybe we'll get... It, I really would be interested, and hopefully maybe we can read it at some point, but I'm interested to see what they have about data protection rules and what that really means. Yeah. I will say one more thing about standards. Uh, we talked to uh, Chris Reed at Ergo X, and they were talking about standards for exoskeletons. And, um, you know, a, a lot of emerging technologies don't really have these uh, standards until you get a committee together and talk about what potential things right this is the whole example of just because we can make uh, an exoskeleton that makes a a human run a three minute mile should we sure yeah um you know what's the standard should we should we where do you put Um, the lines yeah so just just to kind of piggyback off of that there are if you're working in an emergency in, in emerging field um look into potentially these committees to put together standards because uh, what better way to leave your kind of mark on the field by contributing to one of these committees to develop the standards? Oh, most definitely. Yeah. I mean, you That's can be have rewarding. such an impact. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we got we got one more news story. And we'll be back to break that down right after this. Human Factors Cast strives to bring you the best in Human Factors chatter every week. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. You see, the Human Factors Cast network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon, now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, 
personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is Human Factors Etc. We're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you all, and remember, it depends. Okay, and we're back to talk more about Human Factors stuff. Uh, thank you to all of our friends over at Engadget and The Guardian for all of our news stories this week. If you want to follow along, you can follow us all over social media or join us on our Slack. Uh, Mateo has been posting like a madman in there. I'm just going to hang on really quick. I, this is not even scripted here, guys. I'm going to go into our our Slack channel and I'm going find it. I'm going to. Yeah, if I can find it with these 80 tabs up uh, and I'm going to pull out like just like three or four headlines from some of the stuff that Mateo has been posting in there. I would love to talk about all this stuff on the show, but I simply can't. So what you can do is go in there and join the discussion because you can comment right on these things. So uh, in China, your car could be talking to the government. What? Uh, Airbus and Audi just demonstrate the mini-me version of the flying car at Amsterdam show. Ain't no way. <laughs> this one was really cool. Woodrow, friend of the show Woodrow, he's actually come into my office and commented on this in person because it was so cool to see. So I had to go watch the video myself. It was really neat. So remember that concept of the the uh, flying cars coming in and it's like this this modular concept where you have this moving chassis and then you have this pod and then you have a drone that comes over picks up the pod from the chassis the chassis is this coming to fruition this is this is a miniature version of it it's a scale model it's really cool also we have uh satellites that hunt pirates and maybe terrorists uh researchers study the ergonomics of screen rolls there's a lot in here mateo has just been on a posting spree and we thank you for him unfortunately we can't get to all of them today uh so we might visit some of them next week we should just do like a, a <laughs> mateo section of the show oh my god we should uh okay so that's that's a preview of our slack so if you want to jump in and comment on some of those we'd love to hear from you all right we got one more news story. What's up next? Oh, man. So a commercial pilot is under investigation after falling asleep in the cockpit of a freight plane overflying his Australian island destination by 29 whole miles. Whoops. The pilot has not been identified and was the only person aboard the two-propeller Piper PA-31 Navajo Chieftain and was flying on autopilot during the early morning flight on 8 November from Davenport, Tasmania to King Island in the Bass Straits. His employer actually commented that the pilot unintentionally fell asleep while in command of the aircraft, and the issue became apparent when air traffic control was unable to contact him in flight, and the aircraft traveled past the intended destination point while operating on autopilot. The Australian Transport Safety Bureau, a crash and risk investigator, and the Civil Aviation Safety Authority, the uh, aviation industry regulator are investigating the incident and company's management of pilot fatigue. The newspaper said that the pilot reported for duty despite having little or no sleep due to a long night and a personal crisis the night before. Oh man, Nick, this is a lot of scary stuff in one place, but I'm glad that everything turned out all right and he actually was able to land no problem. Yes, me too. What do you want to unpack first? Uh, the fact that you can fall asleep with autopilot on and it not have any kind of like fail safe check to wake you up. Yeah, I uh, okay. So let's tackle that first. Um, should it it be like Tesla's autopilot? Do you know Do you know what I'm referencing? I really there? don't know anything about Tesla's autopilot. To be so honest, the way Tesla engages user, right? So we're talking about the human in the loop part of the human factors piece here. So the way Tesla, man, I need to shave, man. I, I'm just itchy, so itchy. Yeah, I see you over there just <laughs> scratching away. Uh, th- so the way Tesla handles this is it requires human touch to the steering wheel every so often, even though it won't disengage the autopilot. It requires human touch, requires some sort of feedback mechanism. Now there are ways to short that and cheat that, but they're illegal. And uh, I mean, you have to basically, if you want to play by the rules, um, be at least somewhat engaged. You have to at least, you know, touch touch the steering wheel, sure. Touch the steering wheel to make sure you're still alive, breathing, awake, whatever. Um, So should aircraft implement some sort of system like that? Or were they? I wonder if they do, I because I really, really don't have any clue. I have no idea and either. Because I, I would assume that if you, like, yeah, let's, I don't know, I'm making bad assumptions, but if you fell asleep with your hands on, you know, kind of the yoke. the control, yeah, the yoke itself, I mean, I'm assuming it wouldn't pull back or push forward, in, or you would if you were sitting upright and, like, fell, like, slumped forward, and so that mm. would have an impact on the plane. No, I don't. I don't think, if you're an autopilot, it doesn't, you can't. You can't do anything at all? It, it moves the yoke for you. 
Oh, so you could just be sitting there with your hands on it still, and it wouldn't matter. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. Uh, at least to my knowledge, because that was the problem with the uh, Lake Hudson plane, right? Because the, the autopilot was pulling back the yoke as far as it could go, and then the the plane was uh, correcting for some environmental effects. And then once the operator pulled, they couldn't pull back as hard as the autopilot was, so they yanked it forward, and then it violently just nosedived. Oh, jeez. Um, so that's what happened with, I, for, I forget, it's some like ice on the, it's like taught in every human factors course, and I forgot it. Is this like the freezing on the front of the plane or something like yeah, that? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, so yeah. okay. I, it makes me feel better that you don't remember, too. Uh, if you're in school still and are listening and know what that is, let us know. School or, us on it. Yeah, school us. Um, but, yeah, that's that was the problem is that the uh, the autopilot was pulling back as far harder than the human operator could. So I'm wondering. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that the, the automated system controls the yoke. And, yeah, if you rested your hands on it it probably would do nothing hmm, interesting. that's my guess yeah but maybe you're right okay so we started there where do you want to go next i don't know nick because this is kind of confusing me the last part and again i don't know what the rules are for one countries outside of the u.s and then two for if it's a non-commercial you know aircraft right that's dealing with passengers flying on it and that kind of stuff but i know that in commercial aviation here where you're traveling with passengers you cannot fly a plane if you haven't had x amount of days off right so i'm wondering like how if this guy now this is this is kind of hearsay stuff right the the report there's a report that says the guy had little or no sleep the previous night so he could have had you know the allotted time off but just you know had something go on the night before well they mentioned a personal crisis here yeah and and it's it's sad to me that we live in a world where uh, mental health and personal wellness is is treated second to the jobs that we do, right? And this is just one more example of it, right? Where he should have been able to call out without reprimand. He should have been able to get a replacement in some degree. Sure. Right, without reprimand. Something to at least overcome the uh, the problem of him like flying and falling asleep like it's it's lucky yeah. that he actually woke up was able to land the plane later yeah but if, what if that didn't happen well you know like I, I i the article states that they're working on getting him like back up to flying shape but still uh, you know he's gonna get a a mark for this oh sure yeah so, like but he should not have to be afraid like and maybe he felt mentally physically fine when he got on the plane but like why do we not have systems or processes in place to check like i i don't know it just seems uh unnatural to me to to basically put business commerce and time pressure like that's that's the whole reason the alfaro this is the second time i brought up the alfaro tonight uh once with mateo but also now that's one of the reasons why the Alfaro, they just wanted to get there. They were, they were pressured by the, uh, commercial, um, got to be the schedule to actually yeah. make money and be on time and all exactly. that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it's, it's tough to try and find that balance in those things. Cause it's like, it's not necessarily accepted in society to, you know, take the time off when you need it. Even if it's in a, in like a time crunch, if there's yeah. like a personal crisis going on, a lot of times they'll, it's not stated as such, but it's like implied that you should, you know, do the right thing for the company or for whoever you work for. Right. Which may not in, in cases like this or like in the Alfaro's case end up in a situation that people really, really wanted in the end of the day. Yeah, it's uh, it's sad. And uh, I mean, I'm glad everyone's safe. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we need something in place to, to figure that stuff out. That's just my opinion. Yeah, I'm just glad they were able to raise him one way or another to be able to, you know, course correct, and there wasn't any issues with fuel and that kind of stuff. And that the the oh, air, yeah. like the air traffic controllers were the ones that realized it right after an aircraft being unresponsive and then missing its target destination. So that that's great on their their part uh, part of the game too. All right, you want to switch gears? Let's do it. It came from. It came from. That's right. It came from Reddit. This it did. Is, yeah, this is the part of the show we search Reddit all over it to bring you the topics the community is talking about. Oh, the community. That yeah, that that means any subreddit, all of them. It's, it's fair game, every every one of them, as long as as the topic itself, Blake, re, re, uh, relates to the field of human factors. Yeah, it can be and tangential, occurred, right? Yeah, it, as long as it relates to it, it's tan- tangential. 
directly related, indirectly related. But as long as it's related to human factors, it's fair game. Is omnidirectional related? Um, okay. Omnidirectionally related to the human factors domain. Domain of human factors. Do, the, yeah, the, the the human factors dojo domain. So we got a few in here, Nick. What do you yes. think? Um, I think we got time for probably all of them. We're we're oh, no. running, we're, we're running way behind. We're running ahead. real hot. No, we're running way ahead of schedule. Look at this. Uh, anyway, uh, let's see here. Dude. Let's let's just take. Uh, how many do we have? We, have we got three. three. Yeah, let's do them all. Whole three. All right, let's do them all. All right, first one here is by Esoterist E U W, and uh, this is from the. You're gonna help to help me out here. This, this is, is from the user experience subreddit. User experience subreddit. Uh, he goes, what are, he or she, sorry, uh, what are the best tools for working hand-in-hand with front-end developers? Uh, they go on to write, hello, everybody. First, sorry if this question has already been asked and answered here. If so, feel free to just redirect me to previous posts. Okay, I'm sure this question has been asked, asked a million times um, in this subreddit. And Probably, yeah. And they that's go okay. And look for it. That's okay. You know why it's been asked a million times? Because tools evolve. Tools evolve. People don't answer questions. People don't answer questions. And? And times change. Yes, they do. Yeah. So he goes on to write. They go on to. I need to stop doing that. They go on to write. I am a developer, and I will need to work with a UX designer for the first time in my career in the next few months. Uh, okay, so this is taking it from the That's website. That's not what I thought was going to be that question here. This is interesting. Hey, this is real interesting. Let's go. Well, it's almost like you didn't read these things, Blake. All right, I, I read the title. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That's I didn't read the banter within. Okay, all right. I have always been working with other developers on the front end side of our projects. So we did everything directly in HTML and HTML and CSS. Those are two uh two coding languages. If uh if I'm up to snuff web there. Web technologies, yes. Those are web technologies. Woo! All Look right. Them go. As far as I know, the designer with who I will be is it with whom? It's probably with whom. I'm picking uh, this apart too much. Be. Let's yeah. okay. The designer with whom I will be working Use working with uses mostly Photoshop to make his designs. I am wondering if there are tools to make the cooperation as smooth as possible. For example, I've worked with Unity, which makes things super easy because any UI elements can be linked to C sharp scripts from the editor interface. That's interesting. So how do you usually work with developers is what I would love to know. Thanks in advance, guys. That's again from uh, user esoterist E U W. Man, that's tripping me up. So Blake, how do you communicate with developers? This is epic that it's coming from the other side. I really didn't expect this. Nick totally oh, What a me. twist. I thought it was going to be like a, a UX person asking, how do I collaborate with a developer? Um, That's so, a pleasant surprise. Yeah. Hello from the, op- the other side of the pond. Well, I'm super excited the that fence. they they really care. They yeah. want to know, like, what can I do to make the experience, like, in the handoff between us a lot easier. That's going to reduce a lot of friction right there. The fact that they want to be involved, that they want to have a smooth transition. Yeah. Yeah, so the things that I've found, and this is, I'm going to plug something that I don't normally plug on the show. Plug it. Wait, so, should we plug it? I don't know. Do we? Are you, we'll get, pl- are we'll you plug getting it. paid for this? No, I'm not going to get paid for this. Well, that's a good question. We will not plug it. But there's, the, there's on. a set Wait, of tools seriously? that I do know. <laughs> <laughs> there, no, okay, so I, I do, I'm a UX mentor design lab. Like We've talked okay. about this before. Yeah, so you might get paid for it. Yeah, we'll get paid for it. And there is... A set of tools that they've introduced me to that have really made developer handoffs, so from designer to developer, a lot easier. And it, one's called Avocode, and the other one's called Zeppelin. And basically, it takes your designs that you make, like if it, either if it's in Photoshop, Sketch, whatever, and it peels out the element by element what the CSS code is. And it'll it's even nice enough to ask you, like, what kind of CSS are you using? Are you using, like, SAS or just straight-up CSS? Um, I don't really know about, like, getting you javascript back and forth but this guy seems to be really concerned about like okay how can i take these designs and then craft them into something useful for me um, but i think it, it can kind of go both ways right yeah because it, it's probably good to go ahead and communicate with your designer what frame your work you're going to be working in and so they kind of know the limits and the how to constrain themselves in terms of what they can do um in terms of what like interactions they can design or like things that they should avoid and stuff like that, so I, th- I think I think both have sets of tools, but I think that communication aspect of it is the most important. Yeah. So really quick, I just want to I just want to back up. You mentioned two names on the show, and we say it in our Patreon: we are one hundred percent listener supported, and that's absolutely true. Yeah, I don't um, pay for any of that. But I want I want everybody who's listening to know that if we find something good, a good product. 
we will mention it because we'll we feel like it's it's a a solid recommendation. So oh sure, I just I just want it to like I want to clear the air that we're not getting paid from them, and I was not really alluding to anything specifically. Like you're you're an instructor for Design Lab, so if you if you use those tools and you find them effective, then great. Yeah, no, it's just it's something that I got introduced to through teaching those courses. So you are not getting directly paid. I just want to make that clear. So people don't think we're shills for the programs that you mentioned. No, I'm never going to mention anything that I wouldn't <laughs> use myself because I just I don't care enough. Um, there was a I'm, I'm going to jump back into the question here. So the question was, how do you communicate? And the there was a jeez, uh, there was a. What is it called? It's a machine learning thing. Algorithm. Yeah. Yeah. Machine learning thing. Algorithm uh, that basically uh makes turns mockups into CSS and um you know wh- while that on the back sense. end on the back end they will have to hook everything up sure. but if you use a, a a code library or you know material or whatever um just spit it out for you it'll just spit it out for you and so uh I wish I could pull up the name of the one I'm thinking of but there there are a couple out there on the market uh Napkey is one of them I'm just googling this right now Dreamweaver uh oh oh that might yeah no that's that's a, okay never mind uh I'm bad at this so anyway you can go search for them but there are ways that you can train AI to basically um convert a design mockup into HTML so that way uh that's that's one hurdle right that you can use to communicate is by taking out that conversion step they don't have to basically uh go through all that stuff but then there are also other methods that you can do like communicating within whatever product that you're delivering what everything's intent is or uh it, it kind of depends on the level of relationship that you have with the ux designer the human factors practitioner in our case do you trust them 100 percent? are you going to push back and kind of question some of their decisions uh do you feel like you should do things your own way because each one of these different levels has a different way of interacting with uh, from our perspective, the human factors, per, uh, the human factors uh, practitioner. So, like, let's say you're a developer, or I guess let's take it from the flip side. Uh, no, let's take it from the developer's point of view because that's Do what it. this question is. Uh, let's say you're a developer and you trust the, them 100%. Uh, the things that you will need are probably a mockup uh, and some way to basically um, code that up. And in that case, the the examples that both Blake and I have provided should be enough. If you are someone that needs reason, like if you're very kind of, uh, if you need reason behind the design, that might be uh, a little bit more intense where you need some sort of interaction notes that describe what each thing does and why we're choosing to do that for the user. If you don't trust the person whose job it is to design something for the user, then um, you, you got trust issues. Uh, so anyway, that's that's what I think. That's wonderful, Nick. That <laughs> sounds exactly like what everybody needs. But it basically comes down to communication. I mean, there's plenty of methods like like something like Zeppelin or like having somebody use interaction notes, whichever way you're trying to go. But I think ultimately it it comes down to sitting down and talking about the framework that you're going to use and the it, the needs of the user. That's really it. Okay. Want to get on to this next one? Let's do it. All right. What are some good organizations for UX designers? This one comes to us from Deck Deck Who from the, uh, yeah, I know. All right. What, what subreddit is this? Is this user experience? This is user experience subreddit, right. Nicholas. Yes, it is. Hey, look at that. Uh, and this one, what are some good organizations for UX designers? I've been looking into IXDA, UXPA, AIGA, but can't decide which one to join. Uh, I'm looking for one where it has a great student discount and benefits. Are there any other alternatives to these organizations? I know there's meetups. I know there's meetups. That that that's your spiel. That is my spiel. So there's I'm meetups. gonna I'm gonna say that you should get you should still get involved with any of these organizations, even if you don't like find yourself getting a membership. Because getting involved with like IXDA or UXPA, I'll take the time to plug both organizations. So UX Speakeasy in Southern California, so in San Diego, and then UXPA LA in Los Angeles, both great organizations to join to get more versed in any kind of field, right? Uh, and 
I don't know, because I'm not actually personally a member of any either one of them because I don't pay for a membership, but going and meeting the people and like networking, and you'll find that they're all kind of great resources. But Nick, I kind of wanted to use this also to talk a little bit about kind of human factors organizations as well. And so yeah. we, we talk about HFES all the time, but mm-hmm. one that I wanted to kind of plug a little bit here, or I found I've had great experience with is ACM. Mm-hmm. So they have just... I don't know. They're they're just a very interesting organization to me. A lot of it was because I would love to go to Kai one year. So I started like getting into the organization, but like from the content that they put out in their like weekly or monthly magazine to the like tailored content they send you via emails, it's just a great kind of way to learn about what's going on in machine and computing and uh, just in general tech in the field. So, and then how it applies to, you know, more of a human factor side of things. Yeah. You say ACM and that's kind of like a big umbrella term for a couple different conferences. Right. I, I would, I would even go further to say like Kai, right. That's one of them. You mentioned SIGGRAPH even could be, um, another, another one, right. That, that that's all about data visualization. Um, I, if you're looking for other human factors things, Kai, wait, you just said Kai, uh, <laughs> uh, so it shows how awake Kai. I am. Kai, uh, and then we, you also got things like, uh, I triple E and, and each one of these has their own like separate spinoffs. There are, there are pros and cons to going to some of these big conferences. Sure. Um, where like, uh, if you've ever gone to a more intimate one, you definitely kind of have more opportunity, I feel like, to build connections w- that matter. I, like, I don't want to say that matter that connections at these big events don't matter, but if you go to these intimate ones, it's a lot easier to not get pulled in a million directions after you're done with a presentation. You get done with your presentation, or you pull somebody aside after their presentation, and they're much more willing to talk with you because it's not like they have very many other places to go. Sure, it's like you know, like when we were at. Uh, Ergo X, like it, it, it felt very tight. Yeah, it was a tight knit group for sure because they were all there and we're, there was nowhere else to be but this one room. Right, and that's that's it. And yeah. so, like you're you're, I mean, you're experiencing programming all day, but you know, at the end of the night, you could definitely network with somebody else that was there. So, so there are pros and cons to going to some of these big ones, right, where you might get a good survey of a, a billion things that are out there, or these tight knit groups that are very specialized around a topic that you really enjoy. Um, I know someone around the office really toots. Uh, the, the They really um, promote another one uh, for the military. Um, don't know. You don't? Okay. Anyway, it's a, it's a, a NDIA. That's what it is. Oh, yes. There you go. Yeah, NDIA. Uh, National Defense. I'm going to mess it up. Oh, I'm looking Industry. it up. National Defense Industrial Association. There you go. And part of the reason why they... Um, evangelize this so much is is because this is full full of a bunch of defense industry people. It's not necessarily just human factors people. So you, as a human factors practitioner, can go in and kind of um, connect the dots between some of these other things that are going on. And that's that's a bigger issue in human factors is how do you like the organizational level not. Like not the interface level, right? The organizational level. How do you connect the dots at that level? Sure. So I mean, there's there's a lot of good reasons to go to uh, these small, intimate conferences, but also the big ones. I don't know. I think a good mix of both will be enjoyable for you, and you can always kind of find the more intimate groups inside of larger conferences. Like if you're going to HFES, kind of has like specialized technical groups. I would imagine that a lot of other conferences have that kind of stuff. Uh, but definitely get a taste of both as you are able. All right, one last one here from Funny Bunny. This is also from the user experience subreddit. Uh, they go on to write thoughts on material design. As a UX designer, I get asked this question a lot. I have some really strong views on it, but I was wondering what y'all's thought on it were. <laughs> I did it. I did the y'alls. <laughs> y'all's thoughts were. Yeah, so th- actually, I didn't really want to talk so much about just material design itself because I think there's pros Good. and cons to it either way. But, I mean, what has your experience been having to use a specific UI framework? Has that been something difficult for you to have to implement in your projects? Do you ever feel constrained by it? I mean, no. What has your overall experience been? I love it. Yeah? Yeah. Why do you like it? Here's why. We can give them a mock-up. We can... Well, I, okay. Let me... Let's say in the case where you're kind of... Uh, I like it. I like it. I, I, I can't get into why I like it, but I like it. Uh, l- let me let me see if, how much I can say. So when you are working on a project that maybe have demands where um, 
you're working with different teams that could be using different code behind the scenes. You may come into a project where one thing that's integrated with this other thing looks different. And if you have some sort of unified code, some sort of unified style guidance, um, that makes it easier for those things to look at least and behave at least consistent. Um, no matter what's going on. In the no matter what's going on. Services and all that exactly. Yeah. So that way it appears cohesive for the user rather than a disjointed uh, kind of piecemeal environment for them. Yeah, and I know a lot of people get kind of on the bandwagon that it, it takes away some of your creativity or like you don't come up with as many innovative ideas, but I just don't know that that's necessarily true. Now, material design is a little bit different for me because I just don't have that much experience with it. Right. I know a lot of it was specifically geared towards a mobile design and then like translating a lot of that into desktop is difficult and has been different, but it, it's just like using how you use Bootstrap. I mean, a lot of it is to give you something to start with and have some kind of functional code base that you can, you know, basically all look at and know how things are supposed to interact, how they're basically supposed to look and make, you know, development a little bit easier on from the development side of things and quicker from the design side to really be focusing more on am I meeting user needs, stakeholder needs, yada, yada, yada. So I think it's a good idea overall. I know a lot of people just have mixed feelings about whether it's material or bootstrap or whatever it might be. Yeah, I want to mention, you, you mentioned creativity, and I mentioned this on our HFES Australia show. You did. Uh, but I, w- I want to tackle it again because I think it's a really important point. It might I be. I think constraints define or, or, or drive creativity. I think if you are given constraints to work within, then you have to sort of come up with creative solutions to solve them. They may not be optimal, but they are creative. And so just remember that when you're working in a framework that may not allow you to do the thing that you want to do, you're being creative. Uh, and you're flexing your creativity, even though it might not be optimal. Sure, I have to just problem solve. Yeah, pro- problem solve. I'm all about that problem solving. Problem solving through creativity. That, that problem solving Kool Aid. All right, well, uh, that's going to be it for today's show, everyone. Let us know what you guys think of the stories, the Reddit stuff. Uh, if you're a Patreon supporter, no after show this week because uh, we got caught up talking with Mateo. That was the after show. That How about is that? the after We're show. We're offering the after show to everyone for free yes. this week. Check that out. Uh, for the rest of you, you can join us on the discussion on our Slack, uh, which we have the link in the show notes, or follow us all over any of our social media channels at H Factors Podcast. If you like what you hear and want to support the show, you can leave us a review on your podcast medium of choice, or consider supporting us on Patreon. We're not paid by any company to plug their product on the show, uh, and we are paid by our generous supporters, such as Mateo, who is helping us out with HFAS Australia. Uh, and Brian, who's been on the show, and uh, new Patreon, new Patreon. I need to, I need to look up the name. That's new just, Patreon. This is bad. This is bad. Mawa, Mawa is our newest Patreon. So thank you, Mawa, for supporting us on the show. Um, please, please go support us on Patreon. I feel like we're begging. We're begging. Go do that. Hey. Also, uh, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. This goes down in history as the worst outro ever. I want to thank Mr. Blake Arnstor for being on the show today. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk about how bad this outro was? Guys, you can always find me in the Slack, but you can also find me at Don't Panic UX on Twitter and across other social media things. Special thanks to Jeff Olson for our video editing this week. Uh, really, big shout out and to and him. And every week. And every week. Uh, as for me, I will be... Uh, wallowing in my own sorrow for this bad outro and uh on social media at nick underscore rome as well as linkedin uh please take our hfes 2018 survey we took the bonus interviews go do that wow that's old do that it's still important Goodness that's old gracious. anyway it's old hey remember that giveaway we're doing that yes if you're free still hfes free hfes membership go do it if you're still around thank you again for turning into human factors cast until next time oh it, it, it depends. depends so badly